Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my guest today is a journalist, a former CBC journalist, Mark Bulgach, uh, who's written a book uh, recently uh, published by Douglas and McIntyre. It's called That's Why I'm a Journalist, subtitled Top Canadian Reporters Tell Their Most Unforgettable Stories. He's a Gemini award-winning producer. you got to check him out online. He's a, he's a professor at Ryerson University. We talk about the difference between journalism being a business and being a calling, and you're going to hear... Mark's passion really come through in this interview. You're gonna, we're going to talk about, you know, the idea of getting it first or getting it right or maybe doing both. And something really interesting that Mark talks about is this idea that, you know, m- news can be ethically and economically successful. They don't, they're not mutually exclusive. But you, you, you're going to enjoy this interview. There's a lot of great stories. The book is wonderful as well. Pick it up, check it out. Really interesting short chapters from some of the top, uh, of the top Canadian uh, journalists over the last. Oh, I guess 30 or 40 years. Mark Bulgach is our guest today. Uh, listen in, uh, davidpecklive.com for more interviews and podcasts, rabble.ca. You can download them on iTunes. Pick up my book, Real Change is Incremental. I would love it if you did that. And we'll, uh, we'll be in touch in about a week's time. Thanks again. So welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by a very special uh, guest today, a, f- a journalist. Uh, uh, Mark Bulgach is with us uh, here today on Face to Face. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. I'm glad to be here. So you're, you're, we're, we're going to kind of talk about a new book that you've put together. That's why I'm a journalist, uh, subtitled Top Canadian Reporters Tell Their Most Unforgettable Stories. And it's a, a collection of, I guess, interviews that you've done right. with some of Canada's best that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, but but before we get into that, and I definitely do want to talk about some of the specifics. I I I loved what some of the things you had to say about journalism and about your paper roots and about the the passion you have for the news and about this 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 I don't know this channel to democracy, you know, uh, if you will. I remember as a kid, almost every Saturday for several years as a youngster, going to Howard Johnson's on the airport strip for breakfast. And at the end of our breakfast, my dad would give me a couple of dollars, and I would go and pro probably not even a couple of dollars. I would go buy the mammoth Saturday Toronto Star and a pack of gum. And I would come back to the table impressed by the weight of this paper and the smell of the ink and so on. And, and I get the sense from, from reading your introduction that, that, that you're being a bit, not, not, not nostalgic, Mark, but... but you wish things were sort of moving in a bit of a different direction. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fair to say that, like you, I guess, I fell in love with journalism mm. first as a reader, uh, as a kid reading a newspaper. Like, I, mean, I, just, I, I, I kind of understood that my life was um, you know, insulated. I wouldn't say isolated, but you know, here I was just a kid in Montreal, um, you know, of, 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 of a stay-at-home mother and a father who worked in a factory, so my world view was limited, and I sort of understood that. Um, but then, the, you know, my father, you know, a factory worker, brought home the newspaper every night, and he could barely read. I mean, he finished school in grade three. That's as far mm-hmm. as he went. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't really, you know, I don't think he. I know he never read a novel, but he read the newspaper every day. And I thought, well, well, there must be something in this thing. And I started reading it. I, I could read better than he could. I could right. read than my mother could. Um, and I loved it. I mean, I, I just found it incredibly power engaging that that there were people out there who made money by going to things that were so fantastically interesting and so you know at a very young age i i became intrigued by this and 
and wanted to become a journalist. And, you know, the fact that I have become a journalist, you know, and, you know, now at the long end of a long career, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I sometimes, wow, I, I say, how did I do that? That is so spectacular that I managed to do in my life exactly what I wanted to do. And, you know, it's a great feeling. So was it, do you think uh, it must be a great feeling, being able to get paid to do what you love and, and mm-hmm. you clearly have a huge passion for, for, for journalism is, I think, incredible and I think a real... Not only a challenge, but an affirmation, I think, to to young people out there right now as well. But was was it in a, sort of a desire to know? Do you think is that what pulled you in? I mean, you talk about very lovingly talk about the the newspaper banging up against the door and eagerly awaiting for it to arrive, and and then about your newspaper route. And I had a crummy little Etobicoke Guardian route, and I made very little money, and all the right. guys with the Toronto Star made all the money, right? Right. Yeah, um, and you know, but, and. Like I, my paper route to me was really an entree to reading the paper, mm. right? I would read it as I delivered it. Oh, that's then funny. Then I yeah. made money, you know, not again like you, you know. I made like I don't know. I think the I think the weekly cost of the paper when I was delivering it was thirty five cents. Right. So right. what did I make? Weekly that? cost like nickel. Yeah. Um, out of that thirty five cents, maybe I made a nickel. And wasn't Christmas time the best? Yes, that's when was. you got all the tips. Right? Were, you know, instead of you have thirty five cents, you know, like a, a great tipper in those days, if it was thirty five cents a week, they'd give you forty. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good tipper. Yes. Right? And so at Christmas, they might give you the whole dollar. Right? Yes. Redefining generosity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so again, like you, I didn't make a lot of money, but and again, I, you know, I've already said I didn't come from a rich family, and you know, cable television to me was out of reach. Right, and so I watched American channels, Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley, uh, through snow, right? Because I wanted right, to see right. things, and then sure. I my money that I made from the Star, delivering the Montreal Star, uh, and I bought cable television for my house, uh, for my family, you know. But I wanted to watch the news, so you know, again, my paper route, you know, let me receive the paper, but it also gave me some money to buy cable television so I could watch Walter Cronkite. Really, I mean that's that's why I bought it. I didn't care about television programs. I cared about the news. So I mean, I I, I just found I'm sure I wanted to know. I found it fascinating. If I heard mm. something happening, mm. I raced to the television set because I knew mm. there'd be pictures of it. I wanted to see it for myself. You know, so that I mean, what are we? We you know, journalists. I think at at heart, all we are are people who want to find things out, mm. and then we want to tell people about it. Mm. Right? There it is. We know, we want to know something first. And then we have the joy of telling other people about it. So, I mean, it's, it's glorified gossip, except, <laughs> except, you know, we want to make sure what we're saying is true. So it's not like, you know, you know Johnny's mother over there, you know, was out all night last night. You don't do any of that. You know, we, we make sure it's true. But, you know, but, but there really is, it's fun to know things first and then tell people about it. That's what so, journalism is. Well, clearly, that bug. I've traveled enough to know there's certainly an adrenaline rush to, to that kind of a thing or to being sort of, to being on the in, if mm-hmm. you will. And it must be, it must be very similar. I mean, if you're in the middle of a, uh, uh, um, hmm, some kind of a situation, capital S, I mean, the, the energy behind that, the excitement, the, wow, we got to tell others, must be pretty profound. Well, it is. I mean, look, I... I, I've done a lot of great stories in my career, and uh, you know, I say I, but believe me, when I say I, I, I'm in the middle. You know, television is a team sport, and so I, I when I say I, understand I'm never alone. Uh, but you know, like we broke the death of Pierre Trudeau. Like we knew that we at CBC Television knew that before anybody else. Hmm. And, uh, in fact, like I had one foot on the elevator going home that evening, hmm. and the director came to me and said, don't go. And I said, what's going on? He says, Peter's on the phone, Mansbridge, uh, and he thinks Pierre Trudeau is dead. So he found out, not me. It wasn't, wow. I take no credit. But, you know, so I said, wow. And I went into a studio and make sure we had a studio, because that's not always easy to get at the CBC. Um, and I just waited there until he said, yes, it's true. And so he came in the studio, and then, you know, and again, you go back in time and how simple this was. When the CBC trusted its people, I just made one phone call to Network Control Center and said, I want the whole network coming to this studio in 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. And they did. And, and, they, and what they took off the air to come to me wow. was the Olympics. <laughs> they took off the Olympics. <laughs> right. Now, if somebody tried to do that today at the CBC, yeah. They would face a firing squad. Yeah, Mark, I think it was, though, they, they just took off the, the javelin toss, I think, is what they got rid of. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, like, <laughs> I didn't ask anybody. That was the key. That's like, I knew it was big news. Yeah. And, and the CBC trusted us. 
yeah. do big news. And so I took the whole network. That's interesting that you say when CBC trusted its people. What, yeah. what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I mean, again, I don't, I tell, I don't tell secrets out of school, but I yeah. mean, over time, that changed. I mean, oh, okay. it became like they want managers, people higher mm. than me in the, in the food chain. And I was you know, an executive right. producer at that point, so I wasn't like, you know, sweeping the floor at the CBC. But, you know, they didn't want people like me to take control of the network. They wanted a manager, somebody, right. any, for whatever reason. And so, I mean, at one point they had this crazy notion that nobody, no bulletin could go on the air unless a manager approved it. Mm. So if something were to happen, I was supposed to find somebody, and then they were supposed to make the call to get on air. And, and, then, and but then there was a refinement that said, um, but, you know, if you can't find a manager and if you think it's really important, then go on the air for, you know, a minute or, you know, some minor bit of time just to get the news out and then come off the air until a manager approves you staying on. And, and look, I looked at this and I said, you've got to be kidding, I said. I said, so let us assume for a moment that they shoot the prime minister. You want me to go on for one minute and come off and go back to regular programming? That makes no sense. See, so some of their policies didn't make any sense, right? But they wanted control. Well, do you and, think, I mean, do you, look, when I started at CBC, yeah. anybody could get a bulletin on the air. Mm. You were the senior person in the newsroom. And, you know, on a weekend, you could have been the junior reporter, right? But if you were the senior person in the newsroom, they said, you know, we trust you. You know, you're not going to go on the air and tell people that, it, you know, there's an, it's going to rain tomorrow. You're going to go on the air when there's something important. Is so that, I used to put bulletins on the air routinely when yeah. I was in Montreal at CBC just at a local station. I wouldn't take over the whole network. I would take over at CBC Montreal if there was a local story to be told. Um, but now you couldn't do that. You can't do that now. Is that, about, is that about censorship and control, or is that more about liability, do you think, Mark? I think it's about control. I think, you hmm. know, the people... And look, you can make an argument that it makes sense that yeah, sure. the people who control the CBC are, are accountable. Like, I mean, I am not accountable, I agree, in the same degree as, you know, the station manager, right? Sure. Yep. Um, but I'm accountable, yep. and you know, and I'm not nobody. Like I'm not uh, like a, you'd, you'd think an executive producer would. They would trust an executive producer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to know when to take over a network program, right? But I mean, again, on nine eleven, I was you know on nine eleven, I was at the CBC and I was actually in my office when it happened when the, when the first plane hit and I went to the control room. And, like, it didn't take me a whole lot of time to figure out this was important. Yeah. Uh, and I was trying to get the network. And I couldn't get the network immediately. And the reason was that people higher up on the food chain were worried because it was morning that children were watching. Oh, you're kidding. Isn't that no. interesting? So I couldn't. Uh, so I had the news network, no problem. But I couldn't get the main network of the CBC until somebody finally... <laughs> said, ah, oh, I guess it is important enough. And, you know, they told me to, you know, to give a little, little warning to children and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, so, I mean, I understand all these things where yeah, sure. a, a pure journalist in me says, you know, this is big news. Get on television. You know, other people have other agendas. You know, I, like I wasn't worried about the kids who were watching, who thought they were going to tune into what Sesame Street, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so maybe that's a legitimate concern. It just wasn't, you know, on my radar. I was, so sitting, that's what's going I was sitting in a parking lot. At uh, right at the Air Canada Centre, I think it was being built, or it had just been built, I think, and it's now a condominium, of course, that former yeah. parking lot, and I'll never forget that 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 moment. It's one of those JFK moments, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. For for a lot of people, do you, Mark? Do you get the sense? I can hear the passion in your voice. Do, you know, you spent a lot of time, uh, I guess, in the studio, at the desk, uh, you know, um, on the phone, I would imagine, and so yeah. on. Are you the kind of guy that kind of wishes you'd had a, 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 a helmet on it alongside the UN in a foxhole somewhere in Rwanda? <laughs> Is that well, you know, I mean, to be really, really frank about it, it being a journalist at the kind of a pointy end of the spear at the top of the food chain, um, it, it takes a lot of dedication and it takes a lot of time. And if you're going to try to have a family life, mm. it's difficult. Yeah, no I kidding. Mean, Look, I've been married for 40 years to the same person. Which <laughs> 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 is, you know, no mild accomplishment, mostly on her, on her part. Right. Um, right. Like, I met her when I was just a young reporter, and she hated, like, hated when they'd call me to say I right. had to go to some fire of or course. earthquake. You know, and I was a local reporter then. Yeah, it's not, not a nine-to-fiver, that's she for sure. She hated it, right? She hated it. Um, and, you know, like, there were times, like, she'd be over at my house at, like, you know, 8 o'clock at night, and, you know, the phone would ring, 
and you know, you know, some two alarm fire. But I was a low, you know, lowly reporter at those days, and I was a kid. And so they'd call me, and I'd have to go. And she'd hate it. And she, I'd say, well, I'll drive you home. She'd say, no, don't drive me home. You know, <laughs> she hated it. And she never got used to it in 40 years. Wow. And in 40 years, I mean, it became, like, we'd be on the way to the theater, and then, you know, there'd be, like, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated in Israel. Mm. On wow. The, we, on a day when we were on the way to the theater. So wow. what did I do? I just let her out of the car. <laughs> right. I'm sure <laughs> she I was thrilled. TV, right? Uh, yeah. You know, when, when, when Diana, you know, Princess of Wales was killed, we were at an outdoor concert, you know, and I thank my lucky stars that we were outdoors because my cell phone was still on, mm. right? And I left her. So, you know, so that kind of balance is very difficult. Like when we had our first child, she stopped working because we knew that my life style, you, know, you couldn't rely on me to right. be anywhere right. when right. I said I'd be somewhere. So maybe the next podcast you and I do together, Mark, should be really about why you're still married. Well, <laughs> well, the only reason I'm still married is because I have a great wife. Who yeah. Just, I, and she never, I can't say she got used to it. Yeah. She accepted it at some point. Yes. You know, that, that this was my lifestyle. Well, and I clearly, clearly believed in what you were doing as well, right? I mean, yeah. as I know, Elizabeth and I, I mean, we're, there's, it's, there's, it's a team effort. It's a partnership all the way, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, so, you know, she took, you know, at, you know, at some point she realized that, you know, this was important news, and you know, and eventually, you know, she kind of came to the conclusion she was sharing me with Canada. Right. You know, nice. I, you know, I would leave nice. my children's birthday parties because they started a war in the Middle East. Yeah. Well, I yeah. didn't tell them to do that. Yeah. Uh, or a plane would fall out of the sky. And suddenly I'd be gone. Well, and this too is where the responsibility to the journalist comes into play, and and so on. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote from your book. Um, uh, from Mark Mark's new book, uh, that's why I'm a journalist. Um, Douglas and McIntyre Press. You can get it now in the books in your finest bookstore everywhere. Quote: As I get older, I'm wary of believing that everything was better in the past. That's simply not true. Computers are better than typewriters. Digital cameras are better than film cameras. Live pictures from just about everywhere are better than packing rolls of film on airplanes and flying them around the world to be seen days after they were shot. But there's no doubt. We're losing some of the best of what we used to do in journalism. Close quote. That's from your introduction. Those are your words, Mark. What, what, what are we losing? I mean, I think well, I know where you're heading with that, yeah, and I've read most well, of the. We're, we're losing the one-to-one relationship between mm-hmm. a reporter and the story that the reporter is allegedly reporting. Mm-hmm. Um, look, we now you kind of have to watch a newscast um, with your thinking cap on. Hmm. Um, nice. You watch a newscast, and you kind of watch it. You know, they say you know X Y Z reports, and the person narr- you know reports on something that like happened in Belgium, and then suddenly they sign off London. What does that tell you? Like they weren't there. Like the, what? What could be more like like basic for a reporter mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to be a witness to what they're talking about? Mm-hmm. Like I mean, there's no reason to do something from Bel- if it happened in Belgium. There's no reason any more reason to do it from London than there is to do it from Toronto. But it sounds better when you do it from London. Right. Somehow you're closer right. to the scene. That's right. You're not. Yes, right? yes. You're, you're, you don't know anything that someone yeah. in Toronto doesn't know. Yes, reporting Why live from Dubai. London? Yeah. You know, it's, it's flim-flam is what it is, right? And you, know, and you watch the all-news networks, you know, uh, like there's always breaking news, always. Mm. Every night at 8 o'clock, you can watch CNN, and Anderson Cooper will start his program by saying, good evening, we begin with breaking news tonight. Well, mm-hmm. the logic tells you it is impossible for there to be legitimate breaking news every night at 8 p.m. It's impossible, and yet they do it. Why? They do it because you know, they, they've come to believe that if you put breaking news on television, more people will watch. More people will watch. So their raison d'etre is to get more people to watch. Well, I mean, I like to have people watch programs I did, but, you know, there should be a limit to what you're willing to do. I mean, they put break, I mean, breaking news. You no, know, these guys, I was watching, um, I was watching one night when the Pope was in New York, I don't know, a couple months ago. Yeah, now. a couple months ago, yep. Yeah, and, you know, I was watching, and. Suddenly they put up a breaking news banner at the bottom of the screen, right? Breaking news. What was the breaking news? The breaking news was that the Pope had now reached the spot where he would be sleeping that night. <laughs> Monastery or wherever the hell he was going. Right. And, like, how does that qualify as breaking news? Like, oh. under what criteria are you using <laughs> That's awesome. to make that? It's not odd, though. This happens all the time. Oh, man. That's why it's so terrible. I mean, CNN used to... Uh, they call it a live bug, you know, a little word live on, in red. 
at the bottom right of the new of the CNN screen. Anyway, the CBC sometimes put it on the left, top left. Other networks put it wherever they want. Well, when there's something live on the mm-hmm. screen, because mm-hmm. again, it attracts viewers. That's the only reason. Right. But CNN now leaves that live bug up all the time, even when what I clearly see on the screen is not live. Right. Well, I mean, so what's live? You know, they yeah. push the button to get the tape rolling. That's, that's good enough to put a live bug on the screen? It's so, not. So, I mean, so, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't get viewers. I'm all for viewers. Yeah, of <laughs> but course. there should be some things you won't do to get viewers. Well, well, I think we need to talk a little bit about that, the ethics behind that, but I want to just go down the road of so the Twitter-like universe and the Facebook-like mm. universe that we're in. I mean, as somebody sent me a note this morning, I was kind of complaining about the noise of Facebook in my own life and, and trying to sort of you know, compartmentalize it or filter it or whatever. And he said, well, hey, don't forget, a lot of change has occurred through Facebook. I mean, political movements and money raised and so on. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of value, but is, are we still trying to figure it out? Is that kind well, of where we're at? Sure we are. Um, I, we all, oh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, like, <laughs> like Twitter, for example. Like, yeah. I, I, like I like Twitter. Yeah. Um, I don't tweet unless, I, I, I really don't tweet. I mean, I think if I want to tell somebody something, I'll write a personal email to a person I want to get. Sure, it. sure. So, but, I, but I use Twitter as a news source. Yeah, so do I. Yep. So I wake up in the morning and I look through, you know, quick Twitter to see what NBC, CBS, CBC, CNN, they're all, you know, New York Times, Toronto Star. I'm happy to quickly look to see if anything happened while I was sleeping, right? Yep. It's a great source, no yeah, doubt about sure, that. Sure, sure. But, 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 but what happens? Oh, so you kind of look at something like... Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, when, they, when the school kids were killed in Connecticut, right? Mm-hmm. At Sandy Hook, the school? Yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. So, major, major news story. Okay, I understand that. Everybody understands that. So, the New York Times, the New York Times, right? 150 years of building up credibility, right? Mm-hmm. So, but they think they have to compete in a world of Twitter. So, that they were tweeting that day, and they were tweeting mistakes. Right, the New York Times, which has spent 150 years building up credibility, right, will risk it all to get a 140 character tweet out before somebody else. Right. So they, so they got the name of the gunman wrong. Right. They got they put his brother was a gunman. They got you know they they tweeted out that uh, he used a handgun for this and a rifle for that. That was wrong. Um, they had to at one point they had to correct the correction. Right. So I mean, what does that tell you? Right? I mean, what can possibly be so important to get out and you're not sure? Like, like, so, uh, I, you know, so, I, look, I've seen, like, I saw a piece um, in the Columbia Journalism Review, a mm-hmm. serious piece that was headlined, Does It Matter If It's Wrong? Wow. I mean, like, that's not a world I want to live in yeah, <laughs> when sure, journalists sure, don't care. Sure. Because, and the argument was that eventually it'll correct itself, Right. Because some it'll they can put you can put something on the internet or on Twitter I guess and somebody will know it's wrong and they'll correct it until it's finally correct right and then, and then truth will come out well <laughs> that to me is the you know the monkeys will write Shakespeare argument mm. um, it just you know that's not a world I grew up in it's not a world I want to live in really where you know stuff goes out there and it may or may not be right and eventually it'll be right <laughs> right what kind of journalism is that. So it's you hot. you teach you teach at the Ryerson School of Journalism. Yeah, I do. What's your sense for where we're heading? I mean, you obviously mm-hmm. have some pretty young, passionate students in your class. You probably have a few that don't really care to be there as well. But right. but I'd love to. I teach at Humber College in their International Development Studies program, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on on you know uh, where we're heading. Well, I mean, I think um, one of the things I have to do with most students who think they want to be television journalists. It's right through to them the difference between being a broadcaster and a journalist. Like being mm. on TV is not the same as being a TV journalist. Okay. Um, like, and, and again, the industry, though, the business, whatever you want to call it, I never thought of it as a business or an industry. I thought of it as, as, as calling. But anyway. Right. Um, you know, uh, what, we, what, what, what a television network now does to a reporter, I mean, never mind you're in London and they force you to voice something that's in Belgium, right, where you know nothing any more than you read in the wires, right? So you're really not a reporter when you do that. Right. But let's say they actually send, let's say you're in Washington and something's happening in Oklahoma. And they actually send you there. Imagine. Um, okay, now we're on to something. Okay, but do they let you actually be a reporter? You go there, and, and of course, you have duties to the news network, you know, right away. 
so you have to so that you have to stand in front of a live camera, right? So you're standing in front of that live camera and talking, maybe twice an hour. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. So how are you actually going to go and see what's happening mm-hmm. if you're standing in front of a live camera talking about mm-hmm. it all the time? Mm-hmm. And while you're there, let's do a little Twitter, right? Right. Sure. And could you knock off a piece for radio while you're at it? And maybe you can do a couple of paragraphs for the online website. Right. And, and yet somehow you're supposed to put the craft together a piece for the evening, either the supper hour news maybe, or for the national um, newscast later, that makes some, you know, has some substance to it. Like how, when did you get time to go out and actually witness the event, talk to some people, figure out what's going on? That's what reporting is. Hmm. Not standing in front of a camera and talking. I mean, look, uh, again, uh, you know, major secrets. When, you know, sometimes we sent people to places, right, and they'd get there to get off the plane and run, you know, run, drive to wherever they had to be, wherever the, the satellite uplink was, uh, get in front of a camera, and they'd start talking. We had to tell them from Toronto what was going on there. Right. They didn't know what was going on. They just got there. <laughs> they were in a plane for three hours. So I, I love what you said earlier, Mark, about how, you know, when I, when I read the quote from, from your book about sort of the question mark around kind of where we're heading and the digitization of news, I suppose you could say, but this you, you, your immediate response was we're losing the one-to-one relationship, and that's essentially what you're saying here. It's you're not standing in front of a screen. Sure, you might have to do that, and maybe you got to write a little bit for Facebook and tweet mm-hmm. occasionally, but for the love, get in front of, you know, make actual physical contact. Yeah, like, see, you're a reporter. Report. You know, what is, what is the definition of reporting? You go out, you see what's happening, and then you tell people about it. But we're taking out the see what's happening part. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you know, so, you know, when there's, uh, you know, if something's happening in Belgium and you're in London, how do you know what's happening in Belgium? Right. Only by the pictures that are coming in and from the wire copy, from the, which, you know, you hope, so it's, you know, Associated Press or... Or, or Reuters writing about it, and you hope that their people are there at least. Okay, so, uh, but you can do that from anywhere now, right? You can do that from my basement in, 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 mm-hmm. in Toronto. I don't need to be in a television network. Yeah, today. yeah. So, you know, you want reporters to report, to be real reporters. So, I mean, you, if you watch a newscast carefully, you can sometimes, you wonder, you know, why are they using this reporter that way? And, you know, you asked me about my experience at university. I mean, it's interesting. Not too long ago, you know, when uh, uh, René Angelil was, uh, had his funeral in Montreal, mm-hmm. and I showed the, the piece to my class, uh, I guess it was a Friday, the funeral, and I showed it to my class on a Monday, and, you know, the piece was flying, fine, fine. There was a sign-off. It was all fine. And then I said to them, what would you think of that piece? And they all said, oh, she was very good. She was, you know, she, ca- she captured the emotion of it and blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, where was she? And they all said, well, she must have been in Montreal at the church, right? She wasn't. She mm. was in Toronto. Wow. And she didn't say that. Wow. But there was no sign off that said, you know, Montreal. I knew she where she was. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't even, you know, so here are journalism students who didn't pick up on the fact that this person was not there. Wow. Watched yeah. it on yeah. television and then, you know, made a very nice package out of it. I don't say she didn't. There's some skill in that, but it's not reporting. It's so are we, are, we cross, are we crossing over into... Is it is it journalistic entertainment at that point, Mark? I mean, I mean, there must be. I mean, from a from a philosophical perspective, from an ethical perspective, I start to wonder. I start to ask questions about the, that because it does seem to me to raise issues of trust between you know once uh, the, between the viewer and 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 the journalist themselves or the or the broadcaster. I guess you could say not necessarily the journalist. And I guess it's why CNN, CNN gets a reputation and New York Times gets a reputation and. Globe and Mail has a reputation, right, for being right. having a particular perspective. Right, and and that's why you know, it's dangerous when you start playing in a world where you can lose your credibility. So, I mean, I I, I, I grew up believing, it, you know, that credibility was really, really like very important, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and 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 it was so easy to lose. Right. Okay. And now, huh. I think they lose it every day in many places. Isn't that interesting? And, and yeah. yet, you know, they're surviving and going on uh, because. You know, it, it's always been this race, I think. Every journalist has a conflict between getting it first and getting it right. Mm. right? This is, this is, there's a tension between those two. Like you hear something, and there's, a, there's an instinct in you that says, let's put this on, yeah. right, because it's great, and it, we're first. And, and there's another instinct in you that says, but is it right? Yeah. Like, is it true what we're putting out sure, there? Sure, sure. 
and and you know, and you kind of say, oh, well, it sounds plausible. Let's do it, right? Because it's great to be first. Like it's just an instinct in you. Um, but again, I can give you an example. Nine Eleven is a good example for me of that. Um, and again, I, I, I tell these stories, and I don't want to sound like I'm, her, I'm heroic doing any of these things, but this actually happened. Um, you know, I was in the control room that day, like for 20 hours, and, you know, and at some point, I guess in mid-morning, somebody called me from our newsroom to tell me that high-rises in Toronto were being evacuated. Yes, I, re- I, re- I worked at 200 Bay at the time, mm-hmm. and we were in the basement, mm-hmm. and they actually, they actually did, in fact, clear us out. Oh, and, yeah, and okay, some right. and some people stayed, but I think the, the and but what was interesting and this was of course pre Twitter and so on and um, but yeah word traveled fairly quickly but uh, anyway not everybody left I don't oh, I don't know about any other the buildings. Someone says to me from our newsroom he says they're evacuating buildings in downtown Toronto and I said uh, okay thanks and I didn't put it on. Yep. And then she called back and said maybe you didn't hear me they're evacuating. I said okay I heard you. But is it true? How do you know? How do you know? How yeah. do you know? Yeah. That's what you have to ask, right? It's good. It's and good. she said to me, well, my aunt's cousin's brother works in one. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And I, said, I love that Your stuff. Your aunt's brother's cousin works in one, and you're telling me I should put this on, on national television? I said, look, you're in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Can you send somebody outside and have a look and then call me back <laughs> right. and tell me if it's true or not? Oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah, and yeah. of course, you know, yeah. that's mad, see, that's madness. But it is, but but you know, if you put yourself in my position, mm-hmm. I'm thinking, well, that sounds plausible. Yeah, sure, certainly plausible, sure. and it'd be neat to be first. But all you have to do is ask that short question: How do you know? Four words, right? And then you find out that she doesn't know really, and you know, so. But it's so easy to get tripped up in that. Like I did elections for a thousand years at CBC. And, you know, there's this race to be first with the call, right? Who's going to win? Like the liberal majority, sure, the majority, sure. whoever, whatever. Sure. Um, well, I tried to stay away from that race. I mean, I wanted to be first, but I was never going to be wrong. I just, I knew that we couldn't be wrong. We could be second, but we could not be wrong. And, and, and frankly, I know my competition was wrong sometimes. Like I went to every provincial election in this country for, you know, more than 15 years. Um, and I know my competition was wrong sometimes, and they were first, but they were wrong. And then when 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 it turned out they were wrong, they would just change their mind. They just say the other guys won. Well, this seems they to me to make a reference to the fact that they were wrong. Such a huge. Well, this is it, right? And I've I've all often maintained it, and I know many others have. I think it's a big part part of the problem with politicians. Just come clean. Yeah. Where's Where's the authenticity? Where's the transparency? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I look like we were never wrong, and you know, I, I was happy to kind of say we're going to be right. Like that's I thought our credibility was more more important than anything else. So your list, your list of Patrick Brown, Brian Stewart, Allison Smith, uh, Hannah Carter, Paul Hunter, Joe Schlesinger, Diana Swain. Um, you've got so many uh, different journalists and their stories, and very compelling, very interesting read. Um, Diana Swain says in her chapter that uh, quote journalism is about making things better close quote, mm-hmm. and says that you know that's why I'm a journalist. It's kind of why I got in in the first place. Is I mean, is that is that a fair statement? I mean, you've forty years. You've been in some incredibly important situations and produced some Gemini award-winning programs. Um, you've probably met everybody pretty much in the field. You're now teaching. Mm-hmm. Is Mark? Is that really journalism? It, or you know, after having our chit chat here about, <laughs> I guess about the well, you know the digital should. side and the yeah. entertainment side, is it still about making the world a better place? It's what it should be, and okay. then, you know, and you know, for for me, the book, you know, like. It's not a textbook, right? It's 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 interesting read in my view. Like, mm-hmm. one should read this to watch the news, and you'll see a little bit about the people you see every night. And I think young journalists, especially, should read it because they'll see what real journalism is. I right. mean, I think the problem, like, is what a, part of what I've described is how most newsrooms work these days. Right. And so I think a young kid, a, a recent graduate, shall we say, would go into a newsroom and see what I now call like a diet of uh, potato chips and mm. Coca-Cola, mm. news diet, whereas right. when I grew up, it was steak and potatoes. So right. now it's potato chips and Coca-Cola. And a, and a young person goes into a newsroom and sees potato chips and Coca-Cola as a steady diet and must come to the conclusion that this is pretty good. That, right. This is what right. news is. Right. And so if you read the book, it kind of tells you, no, wait a minute. 
It's not potato chips and Coca-Cola. It's steak and potatoes. Look, this is real journalism. This is journalism that takes sometimes months and years to dig out the truth on stories. It's, it's about dogged persistence. It's about mm. moving away from the pack sometimes. Everyone's there. You go there and see what right. story you can find. It's about um, you know, being in the right place at the right time. It's about having some courage sometimes. But it's, it's about keeping your head about you and thinking about things. It's never about 140 characters. It's never about that. Never. You know? So, I mean, the, look, I, I wasn't a reporter for very long. And, you know, in my, what, what I think journalists can do, no matter who they are or where they are, is bring out the truth and let people understand what's going on. Nice. Right? Like, I'm not, like, I had one vote as a, you know, as a Canadian, right? So in any election, I voted. I did. Once. I don't want like 35 million votes. I want one vote, but I want your vote to be informed. Shall right. I, say. Mm-hmm. I want your opinion to be informed every day. And so I'm, what I think a journalist should be doing is uncovering the truth as best they can and giving you, you know, both sides of a story mm-hmm. and then say, here now, now you are informed citizen. You should be a citizen. You shouldn't just let like the water skiing squirrel be their knowledge of the world. That's not... <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, this, yes. you know, I'm going to give you the, the, the both sides. There's some, there's some important implications you, you to that. Your mind. You're a better person now, and that's how you improve the world, by telling people to think about things. Yeah, to go, to go beyond scratching the surface, go a little bit deeper. I mean, it, it seems to me that, that the Twitter, the 140 characters, I mean, hopefully that's going to act as the catalyst, which is going to get the journalist involved, which is going to, you know, require the investigation, the, the the detective-like work, if you will, you know, to really start to, like you say, uncover that truth. But you're not, you're not going to get it in 140 characters. No, you're not. And you're also not going to get it on the cheap. I mean, right. news costs right. money. I mean, right. I, I, you know, the money... Which is a big are, part of the problem, I suppose. Well, it is. I mean, there are all these cutbacks now, and everybody keeps saying that, you know, there's no choice, and, you know, like... like but. but like, I don't, I think there is a choice. Mm, I mean, like, I'm good. not, again, I, I was privileged, I understand. I worked as a public broadcaster, I never worked anywhere else. And so, you know, you can say I was special and all that. But even the public broadcaster, obviously, now has much financial problems that it didn't have 30 years ago. But anyway, but, you know, if you work for it in the private sector, I mean, Bell Media lays off 380 people, right? Mm-hmm. It makes $791 million in profit in three months. Wow. So, wow. So what are they doing? <laughs> Why do you right. have to lay off 380 yes. people? Is that not enough money? I don't know. You know, Rogers now, 200 people, right? Guelph Mercury, 26 people. La Press, 158 people. Well, Post yeah. Media, 90 people. Toronto Star, 13 people. So, they, you know, so none of these cutbacks are in the... Are in the uh, no one can argue that they're doing this to make their product better, to make the news better, to make their journalism better. No one argues that. They're not that, you know, no one right. argues that. right. You know, I completely think they could get away with that. They would make the argument that, you know, in these economic times and, you know, in these changing media worlds, we have to, you know, be careful with our money and we have to, you know, become leaner and meaner. Okay, so $791 million in three months is apparently not enough. Okay, I'm not a big business guy, I don't know. But they make choices at Bell and they make choices at Rogers. I mean, Bell and Rogers, I mean, jointly own the Toronto Maple Leafs. They chose to give fifty million dollars to to a hockey coach, so they make choices with their mm-hmm. money. Yeah, of course. Now you know it's a different business; it's all that. But you know, all I'm saying is, there are choices to be made, just like you and I make choices every day. You know, if we live in a house, and you know your kitchen could use a painting, but you have a crack in the foundation, you have a choice: which one you're going to deal with. Well, you might get a lot of pleasure by painting the kitchen because you'll look nice, but. Your house will crumble, <laughs> yeah. but you don't get any satisfaction by fixing the foundation you, you, back because you can't see it. You talk about you talk about journalism undergoing existential threats mm-hmm. in your book, and that you know I love your phrase about how you know buying a newspaper or watching news is is is, is becoming like a prehistoric ritual of of, of a particular sort, mm-hmm. um, and and yet and yet there's an irony there that we have so much access, right? Constant yeah. access. I'm sitting in the doctor's office. I can read the news. I'm riding a bike at the gym. I can read the news and so on. Is it making us more informed? Is it actually, uh, uh, are, are we acting more? Are we becoming more proactive? Are we becoming, you know, better citizens, if you will, as a result of this? And it sounds to me like you're kind of questioning that notion, not only, you know, in our interview here, but with 
you know, narratively with the stories that you're telling in your book. Yeah, I don't think we are. I mean, mm. again, I'm old enough to remember when CNN started, right? When CNN started, the first 24-hour news channel in the world, mm-hmm. a lot of us and a lot of, you know, experts said this is laughable, that there is, it'll never fly because there isn't 24 hours worth of news every day. Right. And we were right about that. <laughs> right, right. There isn't 24 hours news of news right. every day worth putting on television. But what they ended up doing, because they were on for 24 hours, and there isn't enough news, is they started putting blather on, right? right. They would talk about stuff right. all day. Right. So you get all these talking heads. So now if you watch a, 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 what is they call an all-news channel, it's not news at all. It's just blather. They just talk and talk endlessly. I mean, I mean about Iowa and about New Hampshire and about this and about that. It's just talk. It's not news. And then they put in the corner, like, they put these countdown clocks, like, but the countdown clock, not like 20 minutes away. Like, we're only 18 days away from the next Republican debate. And right. they have a countdown clock on the screen. Like, who sits there for 18 days worried about when the next <laughs> debate is? Nobody. It's just craziness. Like, it drives me crazy. I bet it does. Yeah. But, you know, because not, we're not better but, informed at all. No, but, we're not. You You'd know, be much better informed if you read one newspaper a day and if you watch maybe you know, one newscast at the end of the day, a newscast that tries to bring the, you know, the day together, and if you what, maybe heard a radio newscast once during the day, and maybe check your Twitter feed just to see if anything was mm-hmm. going on, mm-hmm. you'd be much better served than if you sat in front of a television all day or in front of Facebook all day and just kind of watched the, the stuff that they just let flow over you. It's just it's gunk. It's not worth your while. Don't bother. I uh, I have to make a confession that for several years I got most of my news from John Stewart, so I apologize, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was smart. That actually was smart news, you see. But you have to know something going in. Yes, it. indeed. Yeah, you have to you have to be you know informed going in for exactly. sure. And and sadly, it was often mostly American news. But they did he did bring he did bring a pretty pretty interesting global perspective as well from time to time. Hey, you know, Mark, I've really enjoyed our chat today. I uh, so appreciate your time. We're gonna have to wrap it up here in a second. But but you sound still so hopeful. Like there's an edge of cynicism, of course, you know, or or maybe it's just stark realism, or maybe it's just you're an old nostalgic fart on some level, Mark. And mm-hmm. right, I mean, I'm sure you've been accused of that. Oh yes, absolutely. You know, and I am, but I am. I don't want to be cynical about things. I really don't. Yeah. I mean, I I, I want to be hopeful, and and I I am sort of. It's hard to be hopeful or optimistic in this, but if there is hope, the hope is that change will come from the top. Mm. I mean, I don't expect my students to come out of university and change the world because, you know, they want a paycheck. And if someone says, you know, write this story and you weren't there, well, okay, they're going to write the story. Yeah. Um, yep. So it's the people at the top who I blame. It's interesting. Um, okay, have that's to good. Kind of say, you know, we aren't going to do anything to get one more viewer, to get one more dollar. We're not going to do that. And, you know, it's not just me like, thinking this. I mean, you, I mean, that's the amazing thing. You go back into time, and, again, you have to be of a certain age. But, you know, I was in university still when um, – uh, there was a, a Senate, you know, a Senate, imagine the Senate doing something that's actually good, <laughs> had a report on the mass media in Canada. Right. And they concluded that, that uh, you know, I, this isn't a direct quote, but it, it's always stuck in my mind, that, you know, Canada as a country shouldn't tolerate a situation where the public interest in so vital a field as information is dependent on the greed Mm. or goodwill, mm. of an extremely privileged group of businessmen. Mm. So they were telling you that you can't have big business running news operations. And then we did it again in 1980. There was a royal commission that looked at getting newspapers, but, and their conclusion was clear. Conglomerates should be kept out of newsrooms. Their recommendation was that if, if, if any company that owns something worth more than a newspaper, in that case, shouldn't be allowed to own a newspaper. Right. Because then they would be worried about other things, and they wouldn't be worried about, you know, like, like even the New York Times, which started, you know, I don't know, in the 1860s or something, and Alf, uh, Adolph Oakes got this thing, and he said, you know, that, you know, you could make the New York Times economically successful, but ethically successful, too. Mm, that was wow. business. You see, he, he, his business wasn't running a hockey team yep. or running a video company and trying to make every dollar somewhere, every, every nickel, right? He was saying, you know, I want to make a healthy profit, and I don't say you shouldn't, but we can do this responsibly. 
And, you know, so the question is, can we still do this? Is it still possible for, I mean, because right now in this country, look at the newspapers. Only, the, the, a part, like Post Media owns everything. The only newspapers they don't own in this country that have any substance are the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and I think the Winnipeg Free Press. That's it. Wow. That's it. Wow. wow. Media, media monopoly all the yeah. way. Yeah. And here are this huge company, and they're, like, they're bleeding red. And so what do they do? They buy this Toronto Sun chain, and about, that was about a year and a half ago, a little more than a year ago now. And what do they say? They're going to keep the two papers going in places like Calgary, Ottawa, Edmonton, where they have you know, conflicting papers now. They have you know, the Calgary Herald, they have the Calgary Sun, they have the Edmonton Journal, they have the Edmonton Sun. And they say a year ago, we're going to keep them, so, yep, healthy rivalry, no problem. And what do they do last week? You know, they, they say, okay, we're going to keep the, Toronto, the Ottawa Sun and the Ottawa Citizen, but they're going to work in the same newsroom now. Mm. And the same reporters are going yep. to go out yep. for, for both papers. One reporter is going to go for both papers, and they're going to bring it back to the newsroom, and they're going to write their story, and then some editor will massage it so that, you know, it, it, you know there's one style for the Citizen and one style for the Ottawa Sun. <laughs> Is any of this good? <laughs> Anybody think any of this is good? How can they? It's it's just not. But the change has to come at the top. You know, post media is never gonna, you know, do what's right unless someone forces yeah, them. Yeah, I love well and I think, you know, I mean in the field I work in development, I mean it's it's without a doubt it's top down. But, you know, there's also something to be said for that bottom-up-like nature of, of, of your students who are coming out and hopefully at some point, you know, in, in development, in journalism, in business, that people are going to start to figure out that you can do things ethically and economically that are going to be successful, to, you know, to quote your own phrase. I think it's wonderful. Eh? Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. You're, you're the books, That's Why I'm a Journalist, Top Canadian Reporters Tell Their Most Unforgettable Stories. It's available now. Um, Mark Bulgach here today with us and sharing a whole lot of wisdom uh, about journalism in Canada. Mark, I really appreciate your time and uh, and your commitment over the last 40 years to, you know, getting it right. What was the phrase again? Getting it first and getting, getting it, it first and getting it right don't necessarily have to be in conflict, <laughs> I would say. Nice. Well, listen, uh, I hope we can do a part two, Mark. Great. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thanks. doing this. Thanks for your time today.